Hypnosis is really a state of deep calm, yet high degree of focused and limited context. In this video, we explore the link between mental and visual focus. When we are excited or interested, our attention narrows, which means that we get more focused on what we see. Think about when you're engrossed in a movie or absorbed in a challenging puzzle. Your mind and your eyes are locked in. They are absolutely captivated by the task at hand. Understanding this connection helps us navigate the world better. By recognizing how visual stimuli affect our attention, we can create environments that enhance concentration and productivity, setting up a distraction-free workspace, or using visual cues to direct our focus are examples of optimizing this interplay. We can improve the performance that we have and make our experiences more fulfilling by harnessing the relationship between mental and visual focus. Hypnosis seems to incorporate both the focus and the relaxation in, in a way that accelerates neuroplasticity. Maintaining focus has become increasingly challenging today due to constant distractions from our phones and immediate surroundings. With smartphones constantly demanding our attention and various distractions vying for our focus, staying mentally engaged in tasks or activities is real, real hard nowadays. Oh, I mean the constant allure of social media notifications, incoming messages, and the temptation to multitask can very easily pull us away from what truly requires our concentration. These distractions hinder our ability to stay focused, and they absolutely impact our overall productivity and well-being. It's important to set boundaries in, in our lives and with our devices to combat this, create dedicated periods of uninterrupted work or leisure, and cultivate mindfulness in our surroundings. Prioritizing mental focus amidst the barrage of distractions is vital for achieving our goals and maintaining balance in our lives. Clinical hypnotists, they look at stage hypnosis as kind of the, they don't like it so much because it, it detracts from the power of this thing that we call hypnosis and people get distracted by the fact that people can be inspired to do things that they wouldn't otherwise. These powerful insights remind us of the vital role of creating a conducive environment and adopting behavioral tools that enhance our ability to maintain focus. We can establish an atmosphere that fosters deep concentration and mental engagement by consciously optimizing our surroundings and employing effective strategies. A crucial aspect is minimizing external distractions that often hinder our focus. This can be achieved by silencing notifications on our devices, seeking out a quiet and organized workspace, or reducing visual clutter in our immediate surroundings. Additionally, implementing behavioral tools such as time blocking, utilizing the Pomodoro technique, or incorporating structured breaks can significantly boost our focus and productivity. See, these methods enable us to allocate dedicated periods of uninterrupted work while allowing for rejuvenating intervals, optimizing our mental stamina and preventing exhaustion. Hypnosis is really a wonderful example of how vision can allow one to assess whether or not the brain can shift state easily or not. Dr. Andrew Huberman has dedicated his research to exploring the fascinating fields of neuroregeneration, neuroplasticity, and brain states. Through his studies, Mr. Huberman has shed light on the remarkable ability of the brain to regenerate and to rewire itself. It's a process known as neuroregeneration. So the discovery has made significant implications for understanding how the brain can recover from injuries and adapt to new experiences. Furthermore, Dr. Huberman's work has been focused on neuroplasticity which is the brain's ability to reorganize itself by forming new neural connections. He has uncovered how our experiences, our thoughts, and behaviors can all shape the brain's structure and function, highlighting the incredible adaptability of our minds. If you were going to do a breathwork practice, first of all, you don't need more than five minutes per day. If you were going to select one breathwork practice, cyclic sighing, this double inhales followed by exhales for five minutes a day, seems to have the greatest positive effect on the greatest number of parameters. And of course, there are other, box breathing is still useful, meditation is still useful. We, we certainly found positive effects of those practices, but it really points out the fact that some of these innate patterns of breathing, like cyclic sighing that we do naturally every five minutes or so, can be um, sort of hijacked, if you will, and brought into a more condensed form for five minutes a day. And I think five minutes a day is a pretty reasonable amount of time mm -hmm. to ask of oneself to do breath work. And I should say it didn't matter if people did it early in the day or later in the day, but the consistency was important. So this is uh, David Spiegel's work, and he's an interesting story. His father was actually a uh, psychiatrist and hypnotist, and his father learned about hypnosis and incorporated it into his psychiatric practice based on a mentor that he had. So this is often how things are handed down in medicine. And 
So David learned it from his father. And I should say that the effects of clinical hypnosis are very robust. You know, incredible success with things like smoking cessation, incredible success with pain reduction, you know, 50 to 80% reductions in chronic pain, Um, outcomes in cancer even, probably due to the effect, the negative effects of chronic stress on cancer outcomes by reducing stress, trauma and so forth. So basically uh, what Spiegel and his father developed was a assay, sort of what we call a curbside assay for determining whether or not someone has a high, medium or low degree of hypnotizability. And this brings us back to the visual system. The neurons in the brainstem that control eye movements, are either they have a relationship either to the a- aspect of the nervous system that's associated with alertness or with calmness. And not surprisingly, when people look up, when the eyes are directed upward, that's actually in the neural pathways associated with alertness. When they look downward or close their eyelids, those are associated with the neural pathways associated with calmness and sleep, which Mm -hmm. is kind of a duh when you hear it. So like when you get tired, you kind of put your chin down and you close your eyes. When you're wide awake, you tend to be eyes up and eyes really wide. Uh, Recalling, of course, that your eyes are the two pieces of your brain that happen to be outside your cranial vault and the only two pieces of your brain outside your cranial vault. So when you see eyes, those are two pieces of brain, which is just to underscore why they're so powerfully reflective of what's going on deeper in the brain. Yeah, people can look this up online. It sounds a little wacky, but there's something called the Spiegel eye roll test, which is not the, you know, teen eye roll of the, you know, that's usually associated with a different kind of sigh. I'm but, familiar with that one. <laughs> uh, we've all done it <laughs> um, or experienced it. So basically um, you can assess how hypnotizable um, somebody is by having them look up. I can actually do this with you right now. Mm-hmm. And again, I'm not, um, sir, I'm hijacking David's tool. So you can yeah. look up towards the ceiling and then while maintaining upward gaze, slowly close your eyelids. Okay, so you were able to just shut your eyelids down and and you can open your eyes now. And so what I observed was as soon as you brought your eyelids down, your eyes also moved towards me and your eyelids shut. Now, Mm -hmm. I'm very hypnotizable. And there's a little bit of a biased demonstration because I'm trying to illustrate the differences, but I I fall at the very far end of the scale on high hypnotizability, where when I look up and then I I don't want to go into hypnosis and I close my eyes, my, the whites of my eyes should still be exposed for a second before um, so I'll main, do it again. In other words, you're able to maintain your pupils focused upward as you're closing your eyes. Right, and and the reason this test was developed, to be clear, because I realize this is probably all sounding a little bit um, wacko to people. The reason that this was developed is that there's a known role of particular cranial nerves, okay? Three, four, and seven, um, as well as some other cranial nerves. One set of cranial nerves directs the eyes upward and is associated with alertness. The other set of cranial nerves directs the eyes downwards associated with closing of the eyelid. So these are two competing circuits. People who are are very capable of being hypnotized tend to be able to maintain activation of both circuits simultaneously, which will make sense for what I'm gonna say next, which is that hypnosis is really a state of deep calm yet high degree of focused and limited context. So we remember that autonomic seesaw that we're either, you know, asleep or panicked, asleep, you know, drowsy or or alert. And, you know, in a waking state like you or I are in now, probably um, more towards alert but calm, kind of the seesaw is even. So this is a almost a uh, an unusual bending of the seesaw in a way that you're both very relaxed and very alert and context is limited by whatever the hypnotist says. Now, In clinical hypnosis, the goal is to get the person to self-direct their own mental changes. Whereas in stage hypnosis, the goal is exactly the same, bring people into a state of very calm, narrow, but narrow context and increased focus. But the hypnotist is interested in directing the person's actions and states. So that's the the key distinction. Mm -hmm. And I think that clinical hypnotists like Spiegel and others who are also board certified physicians and psychiatrists, but I think all clinical hypnotists, they look at stage hypnosis as kind of the, um, they don't like it so much because it, it detracts from the power of this thing that we call hypnosis. And people get distracted by the fact that people can be inspired to do things that they wouldn't otherwise. So in a clinical hypnosis session, Spiegel or, or someone else would bring you in, you do the, this, this test, you would probably fall into the category of, of low to mo- moderate hypnotizability. That might rule you out, but for most people, they're going to be moderate to high levels of hypnotizability. And then there would be some discussion while you were in this state of hypnosis where the clinician would encourage you to 
think about certain aspects of whatever it is that you're dealing with. So maybe it was um, uh, problems with focus and they would have you visualize two, um, two spotlights and bringing them together. Maybe it would be to focus on something that really bothers you quite a lot and the bodily sensations and then to dissociate those bodily sensations. And the degree of positive clinical outcomes using hypnosis, again, are just remarkable. Mm. If people want to try this, th there is an app I can mention with that Spiegel has developed on the basis of the clinical data and a lot of scientific studies exploring the brain areas that are activated. It's called Reverie, R-E-V-E-R-I. And there are other clinical tools for hypnosis. I've personally found hypnosis to be very valuable for enhancing my ability to get into sleep. And for any time that I'm dealing with a problem that I can't seem to solve simply by uh, talking, running, uh, and a couple of good nights sleep. Or, um, or any kind of cathartic behavior that I might right. attempt. So th there's a lot there, and uh, and there's a lot more to be said about that. And, and maybe uh, Spiegel should should step in at some point and join the conversation. But I think that hypnosis is really a wonderful example of how vision can allow one to assess whether or not the brain can shift state easily or not. It certainly involves narrowing of visual fields in order to anchor focus, and there's also a respiration component. Almost always in hypnosis, the hypnotist will encourage the person to take a deep breath as they close their eyes and to then imagine floating and being in a state of calm. And the bigger theme here, perhaps the most important theme, is that neuroplasticity, the brain and nervous system's ability to change in response to experience, really is a two-part process. The first part of that process always involves focus and attention. Especially as an adult, you simply cannot learn unless you are focused on what you want to learn. We know this. As a kid, there's a bit more passive learning. But as an adult, unless it's a negative event, which tends to automatically recruit your focus, right? The hot stove, the horrible experience, the car crash, the trauma of any kind, which immediately grabs all your uh, attention, you have to direct your attention. And then the second part of neuroplasticity, because it is indeed a process, is periods of deep rest. It is during periods of sleep and what we call non-sleep deep rest that the neural circuits themselves change and rewire. Mm. Hypnosis seems to incorporate both the focus and the relaxation in, in a way that accelerates neuroplasticity. And so while it might seem kind of mystical or wacky or crazy, it makes perfect sense as to why this would be. It grabs both states of autonomic arousal, high degree of focus and arousal, and high degree of relaxation, and it compacts them into a single routine. On the one hand, you could imagine that the way to shift one's brain and body around a, a traumatic event or some challenge would be to really fully embody all the emotions and bodily sensations of that thing, and then over time desensitize yourself. So that's one form of gradual dissociation from at least the emotional component of something. You could also imagine that the goal is to split those off at the outset. And I'll just mention, you know, we, we hear nowadays a lot about a FDA approved therapy, which is ketamine therapy. Ketamine is a dissociative anesthetic. It's being used to treat depression and trauma. This is kept in emergency rooms now. This has been widespread use. Work from my colleague Carl Dyseroth's lab at Stanford has shown the precise neural networks in the brain that are activated by ketamine in uh, an animal model, but also in humans. And it's very clear that it causes th th this dissociative state. It actually uncouples brain areas that normally would be coupled. And so you think, well, that's weird. I thought that in order to heal trauma, you're supposed to go into the trauma and then reduce the amount of emotion. But in these ketamine induced states, people actively report things like, I was watching myself, third personing myself go through the experience, which is exactly what you hear about people who went through a trauma, you know, horrible sexual, you know, things like uh, sexual trauma, like rapes. People say mm -hmm. I was floating above my body and could see it happening as somebody else. And yet the therapy for a lot of these many of the therapies designed to treat trauma are exactly this, the sort of dissociative process that is occurring during the trauma. So I don't have an answer as to why those treatments can work, despite embodying the same kind of approach that happened during the trauma. What does seem to be the case is that accessing the state of mind that was occurring during the trauma or during anxiety or insomnia or pain, and then third personing that experience and being able to imagine a different bodily or mental response seems to be the the common theme through all treatments for trauma fear anxiety etc and the additional requirement however is that it's not sufficient to just cognitively rehearse it there needs to be a shift in bodily state and almost always what uh, threads through all these therapies like ketamine therapy or any kind of even cathartic therapy is that at some point 
the patient or the person needs to access a state of self-directed deep calm. Mm. And so, uh, you know, there are versions of hypnosis, for instance, if you're dealing with a particular problem, you imagine the problem on our left screen, this is under hypnosis, and a left panel, and then you write out in your mind the possible alternate responses on the right panel. You grow the size of that and reduce the size of the other. Might sound like, well, why would that work? But under conditions where the total context of the mind is set to that process, and you're not even aware of anything else going on in the room, that seems to accelerate the neuroplasticity and allows people to actually do that in real life out of hypnosis. Mm -hmm.